speaker today, I would like to uh, take you on a historical journey from the past to the present and into the future of computer evolution, okay? Computers are the components, obviously, that drive digitalization, so I thought it would be a good idea to actually look at what we can expect from the future. So this is uh, how your smartphone looked like 70 years ago. The ENIAC, the so-called first uh, electronic computer. To talk a little bit about some key performance indicators of this fantastic system, it had 20,000 vacuum tubes. And when I ask uh, students what is a vacuum tube, I get probably one or two guys who, uh, who, who raise their hands and then happen to know what that is. And then I immediately say, and you play guitar, right? Um, something not working here. Um, and it was uh, huge. It filled a big room and uh, consumed quite a lot of uh, energy. Uh, uh, had not a very remarkable performance level. Could execute uh, a thousand operations, simple operations per second, and the reliability was not very impressive either. So what has happened over the years is actually if we move until today, you can uh, put a, a very powerful computer on basically a chip that is big as a thumbnail, okay? One square centimeter. And to look at the uh, key performance indicators here, uh, instead of 20,000 uh, vacuum tubes, uh, they have been uh, transformed into transistors on an integrated chip, and there are billions of them. Um, power consumption, which is a big uh, uh, concern today, is actually only 100 watt, and it can execute uh, uh, a billion uh, simple operations per second, and reliability has gone up. So you could say all these interesting uh, characteristics, they have, they have improved pretty much on the order of one million or so, which is pretty amazing, just in 70 years. Um, and why has this happened? Well, um, uh, Gordon Moore, who was uh, one of the founders of Intel Corporation, stated already in the uh, 1960s that he could project when, when, when we got integrated electronics that uh, the number of transistors on a chip would double every two years or so. That was what he stated. That's what is called the Moore's Law. It's not a law, it's an observation that became sort of a, uh, a, a landmark for uh, computer industry. And what we can see in this diagram, actually the um, top graph here is uh, that uh, uh, that has actually happened. So his uh, projection was right. Uh, so up until today, we keep you know, doubling the number of transistors uh, every, every other year or so. But I have a very important message when it comes to the future, but we could stop with that. We, we, I, I will come back to that a little bit later. What really happened in the beginning of this uh, millennium was that uh, so also as an effect of making transistors smaller, you can clock them at a higher clock frequency. But in the beginning of this millennium, 2004 or so, computer industry basically uh, gave up because of, uh, to increase the frequency because of uh, it generated too much heat. So you couldn't really cool it off your, your laptop or, or so in, in, a, in a decent way. Uh, so, so from that point, it basically flattened out. And what instead happened, uh, and it's because, I mean, there is uh, like 100 watt or so, that's what you can cool off, right? And that made it imp impossible to increase the frequency. So, but there was still one good thing, and that was with uh, Moore's law, twice as many transistors every two years or so. So uh, what happened at that point was that we entered what is called the multi-core era, integrating more processors on the chip. So essentially using Moore's law to double the number of processors on a chip, okay? So that's where we are, uh, pretty much. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, basically most people, I would say a vast majority of the people don't really care about what is going on inside, the, uh, inside a microprocessor. I happen to be very, very excited about that. 
Uh, because uh, uh, w what has happened I I is that we have been able to hide through abstraction the details of a computer. Actually, when I came here to Shamos in 1995, there was a big debate with colleagues about whether it, we had to teach computer organization at all with the new IT program because, you know, these engineers will only, you know, uh, uh, develop code. So why do they have to understand the, uh, the inner working of, of a computer? And I, of course, um, it was like getting a knife in the heart or something like that. Of course, you, you need to know that. And I'm going to get back to that because I'm making a point with that that is even more important today than it was in, in, the, in the past. But anyway, so, so basically most of the people, what they do is actually to, you know, uh, formulate a problem in terms of an algorithm. Come on. Okay, here we go. And the algorithm is, is uh, specified in a high-level programming language. And then that's it, right? And then um, computer architects design these microprocessor chips. And so there is this is the computer architecture is where the world of the uh, uh, hardware and the software meets. Um, but this is one of the messages out of it that it, I, I, I emphasize that it's wrong to look at it this way. But let's get back to that uh, a little bit later. So basically, a computer is a very simple thing. It, uh, it has, uh, I mean, the processor is there to actually carry out the work of simple instructions, but it needs to actually fetch these instructions and the data to process in, in, in the memory. Now, the problem is that um, the processor is executing maybe at a, a gigahertz rate, whereas getting data from the memory is uh, mu a much slower process, basically 10 megahertz. We want to talk about frequencies here and have comparable uh, entities. So there is essentially a huge speed gap here in between. So how can the processor still keep working because it has to fetch data in every, every clock cycle, to fetch instructions and data in every clock cycle? Well, the innovations in computer architecture can basically be put in two different bins. One is what I call parallel computing, that is to execute as many operations uh, as possible in parallel, okay, at the same time, using all these transistors where, which expose a lot of parallelism to get as much work done in one clock cycle. And the other one is actually what I call memory locality, and that is that it's actually possible, and this was an invention that came already in the 60s, that due to the fact that the processor for a long time basically processed the same kind of instructions on the same type of data, then it makes sense to actually put what is called a cache memory, a fast, small memory that can be clocked at the same rate as, as the uh, uh, processor in between, and smartly fetch data and instructions from memory so to keep the processor going. So there have be, been tremendous innovation in, in these two areas, and there are still you know, new ideas coming out how to improve this, and which has been uh, absolutely needed because we are going to higher and higher performance uh, over the years. Now, g why does uh, fa fast computing make sense at all? I often get that question. Well, of course, if we do uh, climate modeling, weather forecast, and things like that, that's pretty obvious, you know. Uh, scientists need more and faster and faster computers, but there are just so few scientists. What about the, the rest of us? Well, actually, what has happened in the software industry is that software becomes more and more complex, and complexity translates into that the software is running slower, okay? So, in fact, what really uh, more slow and the, the uh, implications of that on computer design has meant is to have compensated for, for the complexity that comes as an effect of software innovation. So if Moore's law w would have stopped, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, then we wouldn't have seen the software industry growth we have seen. And so we could forget about actually uh, building the, the software systems that we do. So they have become more and more uh, inefficient, if you like. Uh, so that's basically for, for most of for most of the uh, applications out there, this is uh, what is uh, true. Now, the bad thing about everything is that most law or this observation is not going to hold, uh, uh, of course, 
uh, as we move on. And the reason for that is that now we're building transistors with, you know, counted in tens of, tens of uh, nanometers. And you might know that the size of an atom is one angstrom or 0.1 nanometers. So there's certainly a physical limit there. But it's also an economical uh, problem because building the foundries to, to fabricate these microprocessor chips becomes more and more expensive, okay, as we move on. Um, so uh, what is going to be true in the future if we uh, continue to look at trends here is that clock frequency scaling stopped and it's going to keep, uh, it's not going to, going to not going to increase uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, gap, uh, this cap on, on, on the participation for a chip. And, but what is really bad is that um, uh, already now uh, the transistor uh, growth on a chip is tapering off. So it's not every two years we double the uh, number of transistors every three years, and that would be uh, that will basically taper off and stop. And and uh, that means that uh, multi-core scaling, meaning that we double the number of cores every other year, will also stop, right? So should we give up? Is this the end of of the digitalization of the the I software industry out there? No, 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 no. In fact, I, 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 uh, I was afraid this was going to, you know, I, I, I always used to say that I, I can retire safely because most law is going to keep going for as long. But now I, I really have to, st I have story to worry about this. And there's a lot of things to be done. But what it really, so if we don't do anything, then really, uh, if we look at the compute performance and we continue to innovate in software, then basically performance is going to start to go down again, right? But what it really means is, uh, going back to this uh, 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 transformation hierarchy, as we call it, then it means that we have to use resources more efficiently. We, I mean, doing software optimizations for performance is going to be very important. So we have to do efficiency measures across the entire compute stack. Uh, there's a lot of performance we can gain by just uh, building the software frameworks more efficiently, really. We haven't had to, to wor worry about it because co compute performance has gone up uh, uh, over the years. Uh, I started to worry about that. So we had an interesting research pro project uh, so we started 10 years ago. Uh, looking at how we could make more efficient use of computer memory. And it turns out the data that is stored, there's a lot of um, replication when it comes to data values. So uh, we realized that the, if we could actually compress the data in memory, then we could envision a much larger memory capacity than there is. Um, uh, and, and this also holds for the fast cache memory that is on the chip, right? And um, so um, basically, we developed a technology by which you basically put a small uh, IP block, you could say, in between the cache memory and the main memory. And that basically compressed all the data that is in the memory. And we could reach a factor of three. Now, the problem is that you have to decompress it uh, as the processor is accessing the data or the instructions. And decompression and compression is something that takes time. So the real challenge here was to come up with smart algorithms that, that can compress quite aggressively, but at the same time also uh, do the decompression at the nanosecond level, okay? And we managed to do that, and, and there was, of course, a lot of commercial interest in that. So, so we started a company at, at this headquarters here in, in Gothenburg, uh, called zero point technologies. The point I want to make with that is that there is actually room for a Swedish computer industry as well. Thank you. Thanks, my pleasure. There we are. I keep turning it off because the battery, it eats batteries. So I'm thinking I'm saving batteries by turning it off, but then I forget to turn it on. Thank you. Very interesting. This is not my expertise, so I'm going to ask the audience now to give you brilliant questions okay. <laughs> to get us started. And we've got number one here. Thank you. Uh, quantum computers? Yes. 
Uh, quantum computers, that's a technology where uh, that is actually, there's a lot of interest in that. And it has actually a very interesting application area, and that's uh, data analysis in general. So, but one should remember, I often get this question about is quantum computers going to replace this technology I've been talking about. But uh, uh, there is actually, I mean, it's not as general as uh, uh, computers as we know them, okay? So they're very good when it comes to searching for data, for example. They can do a tremendous job there, but when it comes to general computing, so it's what I call an application-specific kind of computing technology. And it still has a few years until it's going to be uh, ready to be deployed. But there's huge interest in it. Can I ask you to comment? Uh, to oh, there you are. <laughs> I was looking. <coughs> Related to the um, uh, discussion, the um, perspective you're moving to towards the end of the talk, so you reminded me of a develop of a news story from yesterday that Intel has inv invested $15 billion in acquiring the uh, Mobileye company, which does autonomous driving. But they moved a lot of their so it's not clear who's taking over whom. Intel is buying the company, but they're moving all their uh, division to the Mobileye headquarters. So it seems like a very interesting development here where the a traditional chip making company like Intel is now really being driven by these developments in autonomous driving and machine learning. And there's of course in NVIDIA, which is the other big player here. Maybe <coughs> some comments from you around about this interplay between the traditional chip making companies. I, Intel and, and what, what, did, what did you say? I uh, Mobileye, it's the, this company that does uh, uh, systems for autonomous driving, perception ah, yes. systems for autonomous driving. Yes. So um, what is really, really happening now is uh, it, we're in a very interesting space when it comes to computing because now it may, uh, partly because of the end of Moore's law, but not entirely. So there are, it starts to make sense to build special purpose computers, very, computers that are very good at one application. So for example, Google came up with, uh, made what is called the Tensor, uh, tensor Chip, right? Which is a computer system that is, uh, sp sp uh, accelerates machine learning applications, deep learning. Um, and that is something we are going to see more and more of because of the importance of data analysis is one obvious area. And as you mentioned, with self-driving cars and things like that. Um, and I also see that uh, happening. So for example, there is a technology called uh, field programmable gate arrays, which is essentially programmable hardware, okay? Uh, these, F these FPGAs, they, can, they are not clocked as fast as normal processors, okay? Basically a factor of 10 slower. But because you can adapt the hardware to a specific application, whereas uh, microprocessors are general, it's like, you know, one size fits all, then you can make them really faster. So, for example, Microsoft uh, are using FPGAs to uh, accelerate uh, machine learning. And we see a lot of that happening now. And especially since uh, general purpose processors are going to get, you know, not uh, going to grow in performance as they did historically, then this accel uh, acceleration of entire application domains is going to be more important. Good. And we have another question up here. Um, yes. I, I was wondering if uh, Moore's law stops and all of the lines flatline uh, that you were talking about. Uh, ca can the uh, development of cloud services and data centers uh, compensate for that instead so the cost of uh, calculation for people will still continue to drop? Uh, so first of all, I should say it's not going to stop very abruptly. I mean, there are going to be in innovations that make sort of steps, you know. So we're go probably going to see uh, in the next 10 years that, I mean, people come up with ideas how you can make processors more uh, effective. And also what is ongoing in parallel is, of course, to look at other technologies also. So it's very hard to say, uh, I, I mean, what will happen beyond 2030 or so. I think there's going to be new material and stuff like that that is going to replace uh, 
uh, silicon, uh, as we know it, or build something on top of silicon to make it scale better, and things like that. So I, I don't think it's not as dramatic as you might have perceived my presentation, like everything stops, but I wanted, of course, to make a point of it, that it's very important to think about you know, efficiency all across the stack. But it's not going to be that dramatic. There are going to be innovations. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, when we human beings face problems we, that, that uh, didn't exist, then we start to, of course, uh, find solutions to them. And we have just not had to worry about these problems, and, and, but now people are starting to worry about it. And of course, in, 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 the, in the research community and in, in industry, etc. It's interesting when you, when you run a conference and when you stand up here and when you actually let things be really, really silent, you can actually hear the silence, but also then you can hear your own thoughts and maybe you actually come up with a last question. You don't have to. You've, said, you've given us really good thoughts. I'll ask you one. Uh, you've probably said everything. Uh, that you know, and the best you know. But if you'd stand here, like, in five years, what do you think you would talk about then? Where are we going? If you, you mentioned some things, but what haven't you mentioned? What would be really challenging? Um, so predicting a future is good if you go back five years. What did I talk about five years? And I pretty much stressed the same concerns. Uh, maybe Moore's Law was not that big a concern, but I started to talk about it. So. Uh, in fact, one of the I more interesting research areas I've been involved in over so many years was actually memory systems, as I mentioned. And that was my, top, my PhD, PhD thesis topic. And so it's remarkable. And this is, uh, what is it, almost 30 years ago, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> it's easy to say in five years I'm probably going to talk about something. Yeah. Pretty similar. And I, I think that's a very good conclusion of today because some things really do go fast, but in parallel, we're dealing with the same kind of processes over and over again, and it's also a slow, continuous movement. But having said that, something that I've been surprised of is actually that I mentioned with uh, special purpose uh, computers. That's something that actually has happened over the last five years. So, mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, and that ha what has happened in information technology are these disruptions, right? Yeah. I mean, like internet. Uh, mm. Even if the technology was there, it just happened, and mm. was, well, it was not really easy to predict. I mean, what impact that would have. Mm. So maybe I'm gonna, you know, the talk mm. is probably gonna be and hopefully uh, as something uh, more different than mm. some technology that has showed up. You know, mm. di some disruptive technology mm. that no one was aware of, that's mm. for sure. Because and as many have said before, and Charlotte mentioned it, if I could predict the future, then I wouldn't stand here. I would be very filthy right. rich. But <laughs> I also I'm thinking, when you have a conference like this, when you have great people on stage, you have great people in the room, uh, disruption happens when great people meet and we have joined collective forces. So that's a challenge for you to actually discuss during the mingle. And before I tell you about that, we'll give an applaud and some chocolate to Per. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you sir.